afternoon is almost entirely neglected to the very great prejudice of the service. He begs to have to, to leave to remind them that their country has reposed great trust in them, which is expected. Their honors will not permit them to neglect. Major Marion hopes that we will consider their neglect of duty at any point is att attended with great evils, not only to the state, but is sure in the end to bring dishonor upon themselves. The Major would rejoice to see the gentlemen do their duty with a willingness and a punctuality and hope their good sense on serious reflection will prevent the disagreeable necessity of reminding them of their duties in the future. That hurt. You gentlemen that have been in that position realizes he just cut them to the bone. And back in the 18th century, when you talk about a man's honor and what was honorable and what was dishonorable, it's hard for most people today to even understand how that would have hurt. And he finishes up by saying, divine services will be at four o'clock this afternoon. The sergeant and six men to go to the general hospital this afternoon to bury the dead soldier of the first and second regiment and one cartridge per man, the corps is ruled, and nobody is to miss divine services. So, he was a religious man, or at least he thought it was a good thing to be a religious man. But the whole thing that he gets those officers with strikes me as, as strongly as anything I've ever read that Marion said or did about how he felt about duty on our country, mm. about how he felt about the stuff that we were taught in the, in the special little school. I went to the state maximum security college on the Ashley River down there, and they were teaching that back when I was there. At Sutter, and they were teaching it at West Point, they teach it everywhere in the military. And that says it as strongly as anybody ever said it to me. He was given independent command very early on, and I've got note after note after note after where he went up to Fort Dorchester, but George won't let me put that out. His career at this point of his career really kind of winds up. He was made, by the way, there, there's a. Uh, uh, we well, made Lieutenant Colonel finally. I skipped the page. In October, after the thing, the one thing that really happened was in October, the ninth happened to the Second South Carolina at a place called Savannah, Georgia. They went down there to try to take it back from the British, and they worked with the French. And God bless the French; they really. How the world they came close to conquering the world, I'm not sure, because they sure can mess up things. And they tried to pull something off that morning down there that with all the modern communication and the little boom mics and stuff where everybody can talk to each other and people can look down from the sky and see where you are, it probably wouldn't have worked then as complicated as that attack was to try to bring it all together. And I'm afraid that the 2nd Brigade down there that day was the people that didn't get the word, and that included the 2nd South Carolina. And that's called the bloodiest one hour of the American Revolution. Uh, French lost really, really big, humongous numbers. The Americans, the Second South, lost about 80% of its people. We lost our colors. We lost the colors that this is a replica of. And when I say replica, I'm the only person in reenacting that can say that that is a replica of the Second South flag that was lost that day. Because our actions that day at Spring Hill Redoubt, British took our colors. They found them under Lieutenant Bush's body after Sergeant Jasper had been killed and Lieutenant Gray and everybody in the color guard. Somebody got off with the red colors. They were, we're not sure what they looked like because they were captured honorably. They were captured in Charleston when Charleston fell. British don't display colors that weren't captured honorably. That's the only flag the British ever displayed after the American Revolution. We're the only regiment that lost our colors honorably in an attack. Go to, go to uh, the museum, the state museum. They're still there. We're not swapping them back and forth. They belong. They bought them back from Maitland's family. They don't belong. They, the Smithsonian's not taking them every other year like they were going to because they're busy working on restoration of Old Glory now. The original of that's there. The holes in it are where the bacteria ate the blood from Lieutenant Blush and, 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 and Jasper and those people. Unbelievable slaughter. They ran head on 
We think now they didn't go up the hill on the redoubt. They went between two redoubts and got caught by crossfire from cannon shooting grape shot, which is just giant shotguns. It's unbelievable slaughter. So, who was Francis Marion? Honorable, yes. As honorable as you could get in those days. Uh, not a prideful man, he certainly wasn't a gates. Not even a portrait painted of him. Not much said about him, even in his own regiment. He just quietly did his job. He was a man of God. He didn't, can't say he didn't push it off on people, because he did. He made them go to church because he thought that was the thing to do. Good French Huguenot that belonged to the Episcopal Church down in Sandy, South Carolina. Working with blacks, black and white didn't make any difference to Mary. It was what kind of soldier you were that made the difference to Francis Marion. And that's something you need to go away from here with. That the blacks were very much a part of the whole Swamp Fox legend. And understanding how men work. I can tell you funny stories about Peter O'Reilly capturing the rum ration for the British and the boys getting a little drunk and deciding six of them were going to take back Georgetown and almost got away with it. Some really funny things happen. And, and, and yet, Marion doesn't get totally upset. He just keeps telling them, working with militia, you're working with people that have got to, that don't have to be here. Francis Marion had more common sense and more charisma than anybody short of George Washington probably. And I respect his charisma about more than anybody around. But Marion was just one fine leader. Two asides, George, I'll come. I quit, George, I promise. I really did. Two asides. Number one, did Francis Marion really break his ankle? I don't know. But I guarantee you the whole second South Carolina staff didn't break their ankles. And they all got out of Charleston. Pure conjecture, somebody told them to leave. Somebody told them to get out that they were the last time. And probably the governor. Uh, because at Utah Springs, I think there's something out there, Christine. I got a book that was done by Billy Brunson years ago that can come back and say that 80 or 92 percent or something like that of the militia, the South Carolina militia of Utah Springs, belong to either the first, second, or fourth South Carolina at one time or another. I'll see if I can find that for you. Last thing, you see that line? No. Any South Carolina flag in the world came from some Carolina moon song some somewhere, and that ain't right. That's not the way it looked. The South Carolina flag didn't, wasn't even standardized until the ninth, early 19th century. It ain't a moon, it's a crescent. It's a crescent in the palmetto tree, and the crescent stands straight up and down and says Liberty on it. And that's what's on the flag. It's not any moon. That's it. And all everything is supposed to stand straight up and down. It's not caught. That came from the whole idea that it was a moon or something. It really supposed to look that way, because we're the ones that invented it in 1750. It was on our hats that far back. We just stamped liberty on it for the American Revolution. I quit now, George. Okay. <laughs> oh. You folks that are really interested, this kid is like another son to me. Uh, he's written this book, Dry Reading? Mm-hmm. But if you're really interested in what the battles that took place in South Carolina, uh, He's got, it's North and South Carolina, he's got the order of battle down to company command level of who commanded what on both sides and the number of casualties and really a well done thing. We have them for sale here. Now, I don't know him anymore. Thank you. One thing that, uh, don't go away. We had yesterday, we had teachers from the local area in here and uh, that's why the tent is set up. If you want to take a look at this, is accurate like Herb said, but that's not a two-person tent. That's a six, five. five or six people in there. So walk by and look at it. You're going to get to know your buddy pretty close when you uh, do that. The bus is waiting outside. her and her husband uh, Bob when they moved to Santee and just delightful people and glad to have them with us this weekend. Stop slowing if you will come. Okay.
George, am I plugged in? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. First, I am not a historian. I am a history buff, but I am fortunate in that I have a lot of friends who are historians, and they try to keep me from doing something stupid when I write. I write for people who are not historians, uh, teachers, young adults, and, and the like. And um, I'm now working on a book on the Battle of Utah Springs, and in case you wonder, Francis Marion was at Utah Springs, so that's the connection, okay? The bloody fields of the Utahs, Cowpens and Guilford remain undistinguished by any expression of public reminiscence. The two former are desert wilds, but they are classic ground. And should the public patronage follow this efforts of my pen, the traveler shall no longer pass these hallowed spots, unheeding that he treads upon the mold that has been voicened by the best blood of our country. Johnson wrote that in 1822, and today we have national parks at Gilbert Courthouse and at Cowpens, but we have nothing significant at Utah Springs, and yet it's a uh, site of the bloodiest battle of the Revolution. Now how this battle fits into the Revolutionary War is germane to understanding why it should be preserved and remembered. Now let's review a little history, some of which you've already gotten today. But after Saratoga, and the French came in on the side of the British, I'm sorry, the Americans, <laughs> England was sick of the war. Uh, the king was adamant in, uh, that he would not let the colonists go. And so the Southern Campaign was devised. It was sold to the backbenchers on Parliament with the idea that even if they lost New England, if they kept the South, they would feed the slaves on the sugar plantations, and the South was worth saving. It was a last ditch effort. First, and as one of the speakers this morning, they were very, very successful. They took Savannah, they took all of South Carolina, and we were occupied. After the Battle of Camden, there was no continental army in this state for a good long time. That did not mean that the British were not under constant attack. Uh, you will recall that uh, uh, Christian Huck and many of the British legionnaires were killed at Brattonsville, uh, the, uh, at Musgrove's Mill. Uh, a lot of, there were a lot of British casualties. And Francis Marion went into the swamps along this area. And so the British were hurting even from the Battle of Camden. And you heard uh, mentioned this morning there were 800 sick soldiers in Camden before the Battle of Camden. And there, Cornwallis lost one of every four of his redcoats in that battle. We often think, well, it was a great disaster for the Americans. It was no picnic for the British. Uh, and then we have a lot of uh, opposition in the back country. And you've got Kings Mountain, and the British lost a thousand men there a hundred regulars and nine hundred local Tories. And then we have the battle at Calvin's when Tarleton lost his army. We go from there to Guilford Courthouse. And Cornwallis kept the field, and yet he lost 28% of his men doing it. Now Green was pursuing Cornwallis up through that part of the, the state and fought him at Guilford Courthouse. After Guilford Courthouse, Cornwallis looked at his army. He'd lost 30 officers. He had a tremendous number of wounded. He burned all of his supplies, and he had a suffering army. He chose to go to Wilmington. Green, well, and eventually, of course, we know he went to Yorktown. Green, after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, had a decision to make also. Should he follow Cornwallis? Not too close to the British port of Wilmington, I should hope. But he, Green is probably the brightest man of the Revolution. And he weighed all of the options. Lighthorse Harry Lee talks about the fact that Green listened to everybody, but he kept his own counsel and he made his own decisions. And the decision that he had to make after Guilford Courthouse is follow Cornwallis or turn back into the South. Now, as I said, 
Green was probably smarter than the average man of his time. He certainly was very, very widely read in political history, uh, the military history, just about everything. And one of the things that he understood, first, the British were going to lose the war. Cornwallis could not continue to take the kinds of casualties that he had taken in South Carolina and now in North Carolina. Uh, Great Britain had very few more reinforcing troops. Uh, they were widely spread in this country, and those who weren't wounded or killed were suffering from tremendous numbers of different diseases. And Green understood that the hostilities would have to cease. Now, one little problem was the French. And Green, I don't think, uh, trusted the French any more than most of the British do. Uh, because he was afraid that France would try to make a unilateral treaty with Great Britain, leaving the American interests out. And if that happened any time soon, the South was still in the hands of the British Army. Now in those days we had a convention called Utah Facitidus, which means you get to keep what you hold. And had the hostilities ended very shortly, after Guilford Courthouse, all of South Carolina and all of Georgia would have belonged to the British. And today, you know, we'd be singing God Save the Queen. Uh, Green understood this possibly better than any other American commander, and he determined that before the British could finally uh, make peace or cease hostilities, that he would take back as much of that territory as he possibly could. So we talk about the Southern Campaign, the British Southern Campaign, uh, as, as being the British uh, idea of sweeping up through the South, but now we've got another Southern Campaign, Green Southern Campaign. The idea is he's going to take back South Carolina and Georgia. And of course, his campaign will lead him to Utah Springs, where Cornwallis's campaign will lead him to Yorktown. Now, his strategy was very, very simple. He would bring the army down into South Carolina, and he thought that that was probably a very good idea because uh, as he weighed all of the options, he could see that uh, uh, patriot leaders and militia leaders in South Carolina could muster large numbers of troops. Uh, Marion, Sumter, Pickens, and then farther west, Elijah Clark. Of course, he probably, it was probably a mistake for him to trust Tom Sumter, and he found out about that later, but at the time, when he was factoring all of this in, uh, he had a lot of support in this part of the country. Further, if he got to Canada and got pushed west, he had the, the Western militia who would rise up. And if he had to get to Virginia, he could go up to Yadkin Valley. Because, and he had just done that, of course, in the race to the Dan, so he knew that territory. And if he got pushed into western North Carolina, he had Shelby and Sevier and the Over Mountain men. So he was very confident that he eventually could take back this, this country, or this part of the country. And of course, uh, he considered all of the options. His strategy was to take on the British at their strongest points, Camden and 96. But between Camden and Charleston, we had all of these little posts. We also had uh, one in Georgetown, uh, one in Augusta, and a whole circle of small posts in between. And his idea was for the local militia to attack those smaller posts at the same time he was approaching the larger posts. Not only would that interfere with the British supplies, it would keep Rodden in Camden from taking the British soldiers at Fort Watson and Fort Mott and calling them up to Camden to reinforce him there. And if you stop to think of it, it was a brilliant strategy. Now in order to uh, get everybody on board, especially Francis Marion, he sent Light Horse Harry Lee down to meet with Marion. Now, Lee and Marion had campaigned briefly in January before Lee was uh, recalled to go to Guilford Courthouse. And uh, 
The two of them got along extremely well, surprisingly, and so Light Horse Harry goes down and meets with Marion again and lays out Green's strategy. And Marion was a reasonably bright man, but he also was a fine soldier. And when the Major General gives an order, he would follow it. And so the first encounter was Fort Watson. And you know what happened to Fort Watson. You've just heard the, visited the site and, and heard the story. While Green was north of Camden, he received the prisoners from Fort Watson and word that Fort Watson had fallen. Green was not planning on attacking right then, but Rodden went out and attacked Green. And Rodden won, you know, hands down, the Battle of Popkirk Hill. But then Rodden had a problem. He tried to follow Green and then realized he had Lee and Marion behind him. The uh, supplies he needed were at Fort Mott. And now Lee and Marion are sieging Fort Mott. Rodden decides that he's got to evacuate Camden. And so he does. And so Green does not win the battle, but he wins the territory. And moves down after that, that battle, meets at Fort Mott with Lee and Marion. Now, Lee and Green go way back. They have been acquainted for years. But Green had never met Marion until after the battle, after Fort Mott fell. And, uh, uh, and Marion was sort of out of sorts. The men wouldn't come in great enough numbers. And uh, they were hassling him because they wanted his horses. And he thought he might retire and go to Philadelphia. And uh, Green sort of sweet talks Marion into continuing the struggle. And as nearly as I can tell, there's no more talk of Marion resigning or retiring or giving up his command from that point on. Green had expected Thomas Sumter to join him at Hopkirk Hill, and Thomas Sumter didn't. Uh, Green then moved against 96 sent Light Horse Harry over to Augusta, and with Elijah Clark of the Georgia refugees, they took on the British in Augusta, and uh, took back the, the forts, and Augusta fell. And then Light Horse Harry joined Green at 96. Kruger at 96 had a star-shaped fort, and he had very, very fine soldiers to defend it and Green could not make any headway on that siege. And then one of the interesting events happened. Uh, Green got a message that had been intercepted. It was a message from Cornwallis to Rodden in Char Char uh, Charleston. And Cornwallis explained that 2,000 fresh troops <coughs> were coming from Ireland, three battalions, the 3rd, the 19th, and the 30th regiments of foot. And they were first supposed to land in New York, but for some reason they were now going to land in Charleston. And Cornwallis ordered Rodden not to let those troops disembark, but to send them to him in Virginia. Rodden never got the message. Green got it. And Green knew then that Rodden would have reinforcements to come after him at 96. And so again, he sent word to his buddy, <coughs> Thomas Sumter, and asked him to interfere with Rodden in his march from Charleston to 96. And guess what? Sumter didn't show up. And so Rodden, with these fresh troops, the, the light uh, infantry companies, the flank companies of these three regiments, moved against uh, Green at 96 and broke the siege. And Green withdrew. Uh, again, then the British evacuated 96. He did win the battle, but he won the territory. They, uh, uh, Rodden had quick marched these people from Ireland in June or July, they arrived in June, uh, heavy uniforms, and uh, 50 of them died of heat stroke. 
So most of the casualties the British suffered at the 96 siege were caused by South Carolina summer. Rawdon moved the troops uh, back to the Orangeburg area, and it appeared for a time that there was going to be a battle in the Orangeburg area, but it never really materialized. Nobody, it was the middle of the summer, and, and Lee says half of both armies were sick, and they really didn't want to fight. Uh, Rodden was extremely ill. He had recurrent malaria, and he wanted to get out of there. And also, the, although the two uh, armies sort of jockeyed for position around Orangeburg, they never did really engage. Light Horse Harry Lee talks about that time while they were on that side of the Santee River, and he said the Continentals were living on rice and frogs, and a few very adventuresome ones were eating the alligator. He said if we stayed much longer, a lot of us would have developed a taste for alligator. Uh, <laughs> Green finally decides that he absolutely has to get his army to some place where they can recuperate, and he brings them back across the Santee River up to the high hills of the Santee, which right up the road apiece uh, between the Watery River and the, and the city of Sumter. Uh, you, you have your maps, and uh, you, can you see the high hills of the Santee uh, are north of Watson, and on this side of uh, this side of the of the river. Now, <laughs> Rodden finally decides that he's got to go back to England. His health is so impaired; he needs to to leave. He turns his command over to Stuart. Alexander Stewart, and he takes about 500 of the troops from the Orangeburg area, and he goes to Charleston. Now, one of the unfortunate things that happened that Rodden got himself involved with is the hanging of Colonel Hain. Colonel Hain was taken prisoner by South Carolina Royalists under the command of Major Frazier, and they turned him over to Balfour, who was commanding in, in Charleston. And Rodden was there. And the two of them had some sort of a trial. Uh, the Americans don't think it was very fair, but, but Rodden always claimed that it was. And they hanged Colonel Hain. Now, as far as I can tell, this is the only time in the story of Francis Marion when he went off on a rampage. He was incensed. First place, as the brigadier general of the militia, he had given uh, Payne and his men their commissions. Uh, he thought it was unprofessional. Uh, at that time, his first thought was he was going to go out and hang all the Tories he could find. And Green cautioned him not to. He said, we will take this out on the British officers. And so Marion moves down. He's at the uh, at Pierce Plantation on the Lower Santee. Uh, Green at the High Hills. Stewart is now at Colonel Thompson's plantation, which is just below Fort Mott. And all of that area that you could see from the Fort Mott site today was underwater. 17 miles of flood between Green on this side, I'm sorry, on the other side, and uh, Green on this side, and uh, Alexander Stewart on the other side. So they could see each other's campfires, but they were all safe. There was no uh, possibility of anybody being uh, uh, being attacked. While they are there, uh, Green gives an order to Marion, or maybe it was just permission, and said, that Colonel Hardin down around Charleston was having trouble with the Tories, because they were emboldened after the hanging of Colonel Hayne. And if Marion could, and if he would, he could go down to hell. And Marion took 200 men from Pierce Plantation and didn't tell them where they were going. He never told anybody where they were going. They knew they were going to be gone overnight because they had uh, cornmeal mush and cooked sweet potatoes in their haversacks and they headed west at dusk. 
and in two nights and a day, they were a hundred <laughs> miles from Pierce Plantation. They had crossed the Cooper and Ashley River, and they were at the Edisto. And on the other side of the Edisto, down by Jacksonboro, we had Colonel Haynes Plantation. And that's where Major Frazier and his troops were quartered. Frazier had not only his dragoons, but he had infantry, he had Hessians, and he had artillery. To get across the Edisto River, where, and, and that's where Frazier was headed, he had to traverse a long causeway. Now, this had been an unusually wet summer. And in order to get the wagons to the ferry at Parker's Ferry, they had had to build up through the swamp a causeway to get the wagons through. Marion put his men on either side of that causeway and sent a, a troop of fast riders over toward uh, Haynes Plantation. And when Frazier saw them, he took the ch up the chase. And when Frazier's men on horseback were crowded onto that causeway, Frazier himself at the edge of the water, Marion gave the order to fire. The first volley, of course, you know, they, how could they miss? Uh, Frazier tried to go into the swamp, realized that he couldn't, and was hit with a second volley, and finally decided he had to get back across that causeway, and now it's full of dead and dying men, dead and dying horses. Frazier was wounded, but he did make it back. Now, his infantry had heard the ruckus, and they were moving up toward Parker's Ferry, and uh, Marion's men didn't have enough uh, ammunition, really, to deal by, uh, with, with them. So uh, they took off back across the Edisto, took to their horses, and uh, moved in a ways, and then they stopped, and I suppose they ate their sweet potato and their cornmeal mush. Uh, Marion, the next day, sent someone back to look over the battle scene, and all they found was 28 horse, dead horses riding in the sun. Marion estimated that maybe they'd inflicted 60 or 70 casualties, something like that. But we know later from Frazier's report to Balfour that Francis Marion had inflicted 137 casualties on Frazier's unit. And Marion had one man killed and two men wounded, which was just about the kind of statistics uh, he liked. Now, Alexander Stewart was having difficulty upriver. Uh, he was at Thompson's Plantation. Uh, he was running low on supplies. He knew that supplies were coming up from Charleston by way of Monk's Corner. And he decided that he better move closer uh, to that supply line. So he moved down to Utah Springs. Now he's on this side of the river. I'm sorry, I live in Santee, you understand, and I live across the river. Uh, he moved down uh, on the same side of the river, he didn't have to, to do any crossing, and moved down to Utah Springs. Green, in order to get across the river, again had to make a choice. He could come down on the north side uh, to Nelson's Ferry but he didn't have enough boats to get across in that area, and he was too vulnerable if, if uh, Stuart should catch him trying to cross the river. So he went to Camden to cross, back up to Camden, uh, across the Watery River there, came down and crossed the Congaree at Howells Ferry, and found out that Stuart was not at Fort Maud or, or uh, Thompson's area, that he was now at Utah Springs. Now we know from the records that Stuart wrote that he wasn't getting any intelligence because every swamp and every pathway uh, was uh, controlled by the, the local militia. Uh, the, we know that from his report to uh, Cornwallis that he had uh, very little intelligence at all he didn't think that Green would attack him because he said that Marion was down at the Pon Pon, which is the Indian uh, name for the Edisto, and he didn't think that Green would attack without Marion. Well, Stuart hadn't been in this country very long. He had no idea 
that Miriam could go 50 miles at night through the swamp. And by the time Stuart uh, realized that uh, uh, Frazier had been cut down, uh, he was still unaware that Marion had left that area and was back at Pierce Plantation. And he's on the same side of the river as Stuart. Marion is ordered to join Green, who is north of Stuart. And so at night, he takes roughly 250 men on horseback and rides around the Utah Springs area to join Green north of there. And of course, he is never detected. Of course, you know his home is just very close to Utah Springs. And so, you know, he knew all the back roads and the paths and the swamps and all. And so he joins Green either at Lawrence Plantation uh, or Burdell's, depending on whose uh, resource you, you use. Now, the, the armies that are assembled uh, are a little bit different. Stuart has regulars with him, either provincial regulars or British regulars. Uh, most of them have seen tremendous service in this, in this state, the 63rd and 64th Regiments of Foot, the 84th Regiment of Foot, and then these three new regiments that uh, had arrived from Ireland had not seen a tremendous amount of, of action, but uh, uh, by now ought to have an idea of what it was like to fight here. One regiment did fight at Quinby Bridge uh, when uh, Lee and Marion fought under Lighthorse, I mean, Lee and uh, Marion fought under Thomas Sumter, and uh, uh, Marion took, I think, uh, 58 casualties, and he never forgave Thomas Sumter for those casualties. So the 19th Regiment of Foot had already been engaged in close combat, and the flank companies of all three regiments. And then we had all of those provincial regulars who had been evacuated from 96. So Stuart had roughly 2,200 men who were in excellent fighting condition, well, maybe not condition, but they were well trained. Uh, they too were sick. Green had uh, some serious problems. He was promised 2,000 new recruits from Virginia. But Cornwallis was in Virginia, so the Virginians decided they'd stay home and they did not send uh, the, the men promised. Uh, he was promised men from uh, North Carolina, North Carolina Continentals, and, and while they were trying to recruit their men, they had smallpox outbreaks at Halifax and at Hillsborough. So they finally did get some North Carolina Continentals, but these people weren't in the greatest shape in the world either. And then he was expecting 150 Georgians, Georgian refugees under Elijah Clark, tremendous a warrior. And they had smallpox, and 50 of them died. And the rest of them were so debilitated that they were disbanded. So everything seemed to be against Green. He had a tremendous number of uh, uh, militia. He had Francis Marion with about 250. And he had Virginia, uh, Andrew Pickens with about 250. Pickens had under his command some of Sumter's old militia because by now Green had cut Sumter loose. Sumter was a loose cannon. Green could not make a team player out of him, and he cut him loose and sent him up to North Carolina to recruit. Uh, there were uh, state troops, uh, South Carolina state troops that were mostly recruited just across the line in North Carolina, and he had North Carolina militia under the command of Malmody. And several authors have made the comment, Malmody was a Frenchman, and he's commanding a group of people, and they really don't know him. Uh, so that was probably going to be a, a, a rather weak uh, group. The numbers were probably pretty much even. But when it comes to training, the British certainly had the edge. But they were handicapped because they didn't have intelligence. Green moved 
to Burdell's plantation the night before the battle, and, and Stewart was, what, 10 miles down the road and didn't know the Green was there. In the next, the next morning when Green started moving his troops, Stewart still didn't know that the Americans were close by, and he sent about 200 men out to dig potatoes with a very small uh, armed escort. And they moved up the road toward the American troops. And suddenly there was a, some realization that the Americans might be close by, and Coffin, who uh, was in command of the British cavalry, what was left of the cavalry after Francis Marion had cut a group of them to pieces, uh, went out to take a look. And he encountered the vanguard of the American troops. He thought it was just a little scouting party, so he attacked. And he lost about 40 men doing it. But he hightailed it back to Stuart, and then they knew that the Americans were in force and very, very close. Now, if you look at the battlefield map that you have, it's very, very interesting because when you talk about people keeping the field, maintaining the field, I often wonder what field they're talking about. Are they talking about where the battle was fought, or are they talking about their headquarters? If you look, you see that Green started out as Morgan did at Cowpens. He started the attack with militia. And that area that uh, where the battle first started is probably, the British line is probably uh, 200 yards in the woods beyond the cleared area. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the site of the of Utah Springs, but at that time they had about eight acres cleared. And this little diagram will give you roughly the, the eight uh, acres. And Stuart moved his men into the trees. And Marshbanks, who is over in the thicket on the side, has flank companies with him. Now flank companies are grenadiers and light infantry. They're the first responders, or they're the, the uh, special forces of the day, if, if you'd like. And Marshbanks is, is along there. Mm. When, uh, when uh, Alexander Stewart was giving directions to his troops, he pointed out the brick mansion, and he told Sheridan, who was with uh, the uh, provincial regulars that would have been at 96, that if things sort of fell apart, they should decide to uh, use that as a, as a strong point. And the battle began. Now, the early part of the battle, uh, Pickens, Malmody, and Marion did extremely well. But when the, the regulars on this, toward the bottom, and those are the 63rd and 64th regiments of foot, when they came on with their bayonets, the militia didn't have bayonets, most of them. And so, and Melvody's men sort of fell back at Marion reports that he, the North Carolina militia sort of, sort of faded. And uh, other troops moved up. And Green ordered Otho Williams, his second in command, uh, to charge with the bayonets, and they did. And they pushed on the bottom side of that map they pushed the British regulars back through that battle line and back through the camp. Now, where the little tents are. There was such confusion in, those, in that camp that commissary people, quartermaster like, like and merchants and hangers-on thought that the battle was lost. And they started down that Charleston Road. They burned a lot before they left, and by the time they got to Charleston, they were so panicked that the British in Charleston had slaves out cutting trees to put across the road. They thought the Americans were just right behind them. It is that group that stopped in the British camp. Now, when you say, when you read accounts that they got drunk, I think that that's a bad rap. I mean, how much liquor was laying around in, in a common ordinary soldier's tent. If he had any, he probably carried it with him in his canteen.
But anyway, these men, Green explains, were so poorly clothed that they used Spanish moss to pad their bodies so their cartridge cases wouldn't rub their skin raw, and they had pads of Spanish moss against their shoulder to take the impact of their weapons. These people were half naked, and many of them were without shoes. And what did they find in the British camp? Food, and maybe a little rum. They found shoes and clothing. Now, you can imagine the battle's gone on for quite some time. You can imagine what it was like uh, black powder smoke all over. The people on that side of the road thought the battle was over. They had no idea what was happening on the other side of the battlefield. And that was not a happy uh, situation at all. Because Marshbanks in that thicket was able to pour land into the side of the, the American forces. And so Washington attempted to dislodge Marshbanks, and he charged with his cavalry. Getting close to that area, he realized he couldn't get his horses in there, so he wheeled and hoped to go between Marshbanks and the British camp. When he did, he put himself and all of his officers on the side of the troops next to Marshbanks' uh, soldiers. And all but two of Washington's officers were killed or wounded. Washington was wounded, uh, caught under his dead horse. Uh, he received a bayonet uh, wound in the chest. But Marshbanks or some officer recognized him. They took him prisoner. Uh, so Washington is out of commission on that side. And you still had Marshbanks uh, very well entrenched on that uh, uh, right there. Uh, Finally, the Virginians under Kirkwood attacked and forced Marshbank back behind the brick uh, mansion into a palisaded garden. And then uh, many of the British moved into that brick mansion and there was a fight at the door. And Light Horse Harry Lee's infantry almost got in the house. The, when the British finally got the door closed, they closed some of their own people outside and Lee's men took them as shields until they could get uh, out of the, the gunfire range. Uh, Coffin and uh, Alexander Stewart, seeing that the British, uh, the Americans were in confusion on the other side of the, uh, of the road, uh, then started a, a counterattack, and they did get their troops in order and, uh, and were holding the territory. At this point, We've been fighting about four hours. It's the 8th of September. The temperature is hot. The American troops are out of water. Green, seeing the situation, feels that if he can come back the next day and take the field. He decides to withdraw. And every uh, first person account of that battle talks about the fact that they were out of water. And uh, the closest water is Burdell's, which is four or five miles up the road. So he withdraws his troops. He leaves uh, Wayne Hampton uh, with a strong picket on the field. Uh, he is able to take care of his own dead. He removes all of his wounded except those who fell too close to that brick mansion to be recovered. And he moves back uh, up the road. Now. William Dover James wonders why he didn't go to the Santee River to get water, but decides that probably Green kept the troops together in, in the event that he was followed. Uh, the best source of water was Utah Springs, but the British overlooked the Utah Springs and uh, the Americans couldn't get water there. So they moved back up the road. Now, by now, the Americans have 400 British prisoners. And Green intends to come back in the morning. The next day, he does come back, and he finds Stuart is ready to, uh, uh, to withdraw. Stuart left 72 seriously wounded British on the field. He left his dead unburied. He uh, destroyed about uh, 
a thousand arms and broke open his rum uh, barrels and started to move down the road toward Monk's Corner. It was raining. Green decided to let them go and not renew the battle. Uh, Green had lost a tremendous number of officers too, uh, killed or wounded. Now the British say they won the battle because they kept the field. Well, they kept the brick mansion and they kept the garden uh, and they lost about everything else. The uh, casualties were not too uh, much out of uh, line uh, on either side. It had been a very, very bloody uh, encounter. But um, Stuart left the field and moved down that road and Green sent Lee and Marion to go around Stuart and to get in front of him. And they got down uh, to Ferguson Swamp and discovered that the, the uh, replacements were coming up rather fast and rather than get in between those two British units, uh, they withdrew. Green followed Stuart down through Ferguson's swamp and then decided that uh, he would move, he had a lot of wounded, that he would move across the Santee River and back to the high hills. Now, Lighthorse Harry Lee and Francis Marion followed the British almost to the gates of Charleston, taking prisoners. And by the time that the North Carolina uh, militia was ready to uh, accompany the prisoners back up the, the wagon road to Salisbury, uh, the Americans had over 500 prisoners. And as I said, the British had about 40 American prisoners. Who won? the Battle of Utah Springs. Well, if you decide that if you hold the field, you have won the battle, how much of the field do you have to hold? <laughs> uh, in terms of, of damage that each uh, had done, uh, the damage to the British uh, Army was considerable. And especially 500 prisoners uh, took and most of many of them, of course, were um, were wounded because that would include the seventy some that uh, that Green had left on the field. I'm sorry, that uh, Stuart had left on the field. But different writers comment on who won and, and who lost. Green had accomplished what he intended to do because this was in September, and in October we have the Battle of Yorktown. The British by that time were penned into Charleston's neck and they never came out in full force again to oppose Green in spite of the fact that they had about 8,000 effectives in Charleston and Green from now on often has no more than 1,500. But Green had accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. By the time hostilities ended, South Carolina and Georgia had been taken back from the British and were now in American hands. Uh, and so, it, I think it's well to remember that, uh, that there's no park, really, uh, no memorial at uh, Utah Springs, except Marshbank's grave, because Marshbank was uh, uh, wounded and died about six weeks later. And the traveler must be confused to stop there. And here, here we have this little sign about the Battle of Utah Springs that suggests the British won. And the only grave there from the battle is British. And very little explanation. It should be better preserved. And I think George Fields, is George Fields here? If he is, uh, he needs to take on Utah Springs. <laughs> uh, so that people will know that they tread upon the mold that has been moistened by the best blood of our country. At Utah Springs, the valiant died. Their limbs with dust are covered o'er. Weep on, ye springs, your tearful tide how many heroes are no more.
Thank you. Now you know firsthand why she is the world famous author. Oh, come on. <laughs> God will get you for this. You know that? Oh, oh, thank you. You can let your. Intelligent, 
hear a lot to protect your family's home. But tonight we shall hear of from Mrs. Uh, uh, Mott, and she will speak for herself. Now tonight we will hear from three principals from Fort Mott. Francis Marion, in his later years, is portrayed tonight by Dr. Joe Stokes, a professor from Francis Marion University. He is a historian with a keen interest in Marion. Over the years, he has portrayed 50 historical personages to the delight and enlightenment of his students. Light Horse Harry Lee is portrayed by Howard Burnham, thespian and writer from England. He's an educator, researcher, and performer of British and American military figures, as well as American and British intellectuals and writers. Rebecca Mott is portrayed by Athena West Westerin, who is a reenactor with the 2nd South Carolina Regiment of the Continental Line. She's a lecturer on co uh, colonial life in schools and a participant in living history events across the nation. She's portrayed 18th century personages at Saratoga, on the Washington Mall, at Williamsburg, and at probably every historical event in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Let me present for your pleasure Brigadier General Francis Marion. Uh, Gates, 
He was to be the commander of our troops. He was going to win the battles for us. This is in 1780. And uh, it, it was right after we had a couple of defeats. In particular, uh, Buford trying to run away. Got, at, got up there at the wax halls and Tarleton caught up with him. And Buford tried to surrender and he got his men to spike their guns. And Tarleton came and massacred everyone, killed every one of them. You know, Tarleton surrendered. The Waxhaw settlement happened. No quarter given by Tarleton. It, it, it looked like our attempts to fight the war was over. And there were great numbers of people in South Carolina who were signing the oaths of allegiance. And we heard that up in Philadelphia, where the Continental Congress was, that they were even planning to make peace with Britain by leaving the southern colonies as a part of Britain. You know, leaving Georgia and South Carolina and even North Carolina to belong to Britain. It, you know, things were bad. <laughs> and in those days, I was hurt. I had fallen out of, out of a window. I sort of jumped to try to get out of a party that I wasn't having a good time with, and it hurt for a whole lot. And I, and I jumped down, and, and I landed on my bad ankles, and I broke one of them. This is right here, and I still sort of drag it a little bit. Even though, you know, that's been 12 years ago. Well, I went up to Canada, and, and I met with General uh, DeKalb up there, and I, I tried to say to him, look, I'm the second regiment, and I'm reporting for duty. But they, <laughs> they didn't really want me, and they didn't really want militia. General Gates, he sent word. He, he looked down on it, and he was glad to say to me, go down to Williamsburg and take charge of the Williamsburg militia. <laughs> so I did. That was 1780. And from 1780 to the end of 1782, and, and, and part of the way in 1783, it wasn't about two and a half years. That's when I did my best fight. That's when I learned how to fight against old British. Oh, man. Oh, man. I fought them at Nelson's Ferry, and I fought them at the Blue Savannah, and I got them at Black Mingo, and I... I, I got them in one place after the other, and finally, you know, down to Fort Watson, Fort Mott. And, and the way to fight the British was to never really face them face home. The, the British were the best army in the world. And here we were, militiamen. We never had any military training. You know, we sort of learned it on our own. And that meant that we didn't have to learn it from people who were now old. We learned it on the spot. We made up our own strategy. And the strategy was to hit and run, you know, to slash and vanish. And that's what it is. And I, and I knew how to do it, too. And I was fighting in my backyard. I knew the geography. And I loved the swamps. Because I knew the British couldn't get into the swamps. They didn't know how to do that. And they always wanted to carry their big guns with them. And you can't carry big cannons through the swamp. Well, I had a few little cannons, but that's all. Well, we fought, and we fought. <laughs> One time at Black Mingo, I led my troops in there. We surprised them at night. I had to muffle the, 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 the horseshoe so they wouldn't make any noise crossing the bridge. We surprised them. We chased them out. And they were led by a Tory named Ball from that big Tory family. You know, the Nabobs from South Carolina. And I caught his horse, big, beautiful red horse, and I took him from my own. I still got it. You see him out there in the pasture. Oh, no, that's not Peter. I thought he was coming. Hey, I, I took that horse from my own. I rode it for the rest of the war. Call him Ball. You know, name him for the Ball family. <laughs> well, <clears throat> hit and run. That's the only way I could do it. And, and sometimes people would come down and tell me how to run things. And, and they didn't realize that I had developed my own system. And, and I was winning. General Green finally came around to understand that. General Sumter, he, the trouble with General Sumter was, he was trying to do the same thing I was doing, and he wasn't as good at it as I was. <laughs> but he had rank on me, he said. And he tried to give me orders. 
and and sometimes you know I just I just wasn't paying attention to the orders. Try not to disobey orders. I just didn't obey orders. And sometimes people can't tell the difference between those two things. Well, they finally sent this fellow down here, General Lee. He was Colonel at the time. Colonel Lee. Henry Lee. At first, uh, he and I didn't get along too well together. You know, he's one of the rich men. Uh, he's, he's an aristocrat. He had manners and education. He, he's one of my betters. But he didn't act like that to me. He didn't act like that to me. And, and he sort of knew what the problem was between us. I remember that time we were at Fort Martin, and we got that delightful lady, that Miss Rebecca Mark. She, she just as fine a lady as I ever saw. And she said to us it'd be all right to burn her house so that we could get the British out of her house before the reinforcements came. But the question was, who's going to say to Miss Mark, hey, we want to burn down your house, lady? And I wasn't going to say that to Miss Mark. You know, she's one of those aristocrats, too. She's a, she was a brute before she got married. But then Lee said it. He went to her. And to my surprise, she immediately agreed to do that. And that's how we won the battle there. We called it Fort Mott. It was really her house. Well, they had fortified the house. I guess it was a fort. Well, we, we did well enough, I guess, until, until the war was over. And, and, they, and we were going to occupy Charleston again. Hey, I, I think I see him coming. I think I see him coming. I was a, I was a commander of the militia. I was also in the Continental Line, but my troops were militia troops. And I could tell they, they really didn't want the militia to occupy Charleston. They wanted the Continentals to occupy Charleston. The General Green came, though, and he offered me a, a position in the line occupying Charleston. But I read between the lines, and I knew about it. And I told him that the militia did not want to march. And so we didn't march. As a matter of fact, I told him that I heard there's smallpox in the city. And I didn't want to go. And, and then I bid farewell to my troops. I got this out to read it to Peter again. Because he wasn't there that day. This is how I finally said to the troops that this is the final farewell. The final farewell. Let's see, I got a chance somewhere. I'll read it to you. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. The general returns his warmest thanks to the officers and men who with unwaved patience and fortitude have undergone the greatest fatigue and hardships and with a spirit and bravery which must ever reflect the highest honor on them. No citizen, no citizens in the world have ever done more than they have. And I, I, that's so. I knew that. The general begs leave to give his particular thanks to all the officers and men of the country, of all the militia, for that partiality to his person and ready obedience to all orders for two years and a half, which will be remembered with gratitude to the end of his life. And I remember it with gratitude. He'll always consider them with the affection of a brother and will be happy to render them every service in his power. He cannot doubt in the least of their readiness to turn out should this country be ever again so unhappy as to be invaded by her cruel and barbarous enemies. He wishes them a long continuance of happiness and the blessings of peace. And the blessings of peace. That's a good thing. I wrote that myself. And I told it to them. And when I read it out to them, they cheered. And I, and I got up a stride ball, and I came back here. And I came back here. Since that time I'm married, but last week, we, we don't have any children. And nobody left named Marion. About two years ago, Esther and I adopted her grandnephew. His name is Dwight. His name is Francis Barron Dwight. And the, and the conditions in which we, we adopted him was that he, he changed his name and he'd be known as Marion. 
so there'd be some descendants named Mary. And so maybe, maybe that'll be. Yeah, here comes Peter now. <coughs> but you know who else is here? And somebody I want you to meet. Somebody I'm to like, even though he is aristocrat. And even though he's not from South Carolina. And that's Henry Lee. He currently would welcome him. He's going to come up here and talk to you. And, and, and I'm going to go and I'm going to find Peter. Thank you. I shall rehearse to you my life and times. I was born Lee Sylvania, Don Fries, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, in the year 1756, in the year of the outbreak of the last of the French and Indian Wars, what the Europeans call the Seven Years' War. I was one of the Lees of Virginia, one of the oldest, finest families in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Lees originally came with William the Conqueror into England. Oh yes, we were decidedly blue-blooded. Also, I was educated at Princeton. Yes, I'm a Princeton man. I was about to continue my education at the Middle Temple in London. The outbreak, the troubles of the colonies kept me here to serve my country. When the war broke out, Patrick Henry put my name forward to be captain of Colonel Bland's regiment of Light Virginia Cavalry. I was posted north to serve under General Washington. The general wanted me to be one of his aides to camp, but I said, no, sir, I am married to my sword. I want a life of action, not a comfortable office job. I first rose to prominence in the Battle of Spread Eagle Town, January 1778, when that murderous butcher Charlton attempted to do a Charlie Lee on me. A month before December, he had captured General Charles Lee, White's Tavern, asking Rich. And he and his dragoons tried to do the same thing to me. Me and my boys, we did not behave like Charlie Lee. We gave Tarleton buckshot, knocked his hat off, and he galloped away with buckshot in his jacket. Would it have been in his heart? I next came to real prominence with my attack on Paulus Hook in New York. By that time, I'd been promoted to major, and I had raised an unusual organization known as Lee's Legion. Three companies of light infantry and three troops of cavalry. We surprised the British and took 158 prisoners. Very successful raid which I received a gold medal in Congress. The only officer of major rank to receive such a distinction. My brother officers were intensely jealous. They attempted to have me court-martialed. General Washington wrote a letter to my support. Subsequently, with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, I was transferred to the Southern Department. I made the acquaintance of that remarkable, valiant fighter, General Marion. Although we came from very different social classes, we worked hand in glove together against the British. First of all, we attempted to capture Georgetown. We succeeded in capturing the British commander there, Colonel Campbell. And we could have taken the town. We anticipated that the British would form into the square, as the Hessians had done at Trenton. The Redcoats barricaded themselves in their houses. We did not have cannon to 
flushed them out. Decided that the bloody hand-to-hand -hand street fighting would be too costly. I hate to spill blood unnecessarily, unless it is the blood of the enemies of my country. I subsequently served General Green in the campaign that led to the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. I was posted back to serve with General Marion. First of all, we invested and captured Fort Mott. And later, that most delightful and gracious of ladies, Mrs. Rebecca Mott, will rehearse to you in detail what happened on that occasion. Following the capture of Fort Mott, I was sent to assist General Sumter. <coughs> capturing of Fort Granby. And interestingly, at Fort Granby, there was another great patriotic American woman, Mistress Emily Geiger. I would like to rehearse to you now the story of Mistress Geiger. She was commissioned by General Green to carry a letter of instruction to General Sumter. But she had the great misfortune to be captured by a British patrol, and she was brought to Fort Granby for interrogation. Interrogation by Francis Lord Royal, who commanded there. Oh, sir, Sergeant, where is the little wig filly? Hmm? Ah! Oh, sir, rather pretty, what? <laughs> um, Mistress, uh, uh, what's her name, Sergeant? Oh, uh, Mistress Giger, my sergeant informs me that uh, when you were arrested, you were seen to thrust a paper between your, um, um, what? <coughs> I therefore desire you to, um, unbosom yourself. Oh, no, 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 let's rephrase that, let's rephrase that. <laughs> um, to, to unburden, to unburden yourself of them. No, 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 it. <laughs> Sir Lord Rawdon, I didn't know such thing. Your sergeant must be mistaken. I have no paper about my person. I can assure you. <laughs> I am very sorry. The assurances of a Whig doxy come absolutely no ice with me. If you do not oblige me in this particular, I shall have to search you. <gasps> Surrendered 
on condition that he kept all his loot. I agreed to that, much to the irritation of the strutting game cop. But my action ensured the fort was captured with a minimum amount of time and no bloodshed. I advanced on to reduce Augusta. Later on, I fought at Utah Springs, the last major engagement. But after that, I went to General Green because I felt that my services had not been sufficiently requited, and I resigned from active service. But I had the satisfaction of joining my patron, General Washington, at Yorktown, and observing the surrender of Lord Cornwallis, or more accurately, the surrender of Brigadier General Charles O'Hara, whilst Cornwallis sulked in his tent. I was one of the American officers who pointedly snubbed Butcher Tarleton. We refused to die or mess with him. It gave us great satisfaction when that murderer slunk away with Lord Cornwallis on the sloop Bonetta. Peace, blessed peace, return to our free country. And I returned to Virginia, where I married my cousin, the divine Matilda Lee, the heiress of Stratford. Matilda presented me with three children. But after only eight years of marriage, my Tilly died. I was still a young man, and I needed a wealthy wife. So I snappled up Anne Hill Carter of the Shirley Plantation. She presented me more sterling children, including my son, fifth son, Robert Edward. I served as governor of Virginia three times. During my governorship, General Washington appointed me a major general, two stars on my shoulder, so I outranked my old friend, General Marion. Sent me to suppress the Whiskey Rebellion, which I did without spilling blood. Then, 1799, George Washington, who had always, always favored me, Perhaps because my mother Lucy, being his child and sweetheart, died, father of our country. And I gave the funeral oration. First in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, second to none in the affecting and simple scenes of domestic life. But after the death of General Washington, my fortunes went downhill. I speculated, and my speculations failed. I found myself in debtor's prison, where I wrote my memoirs of the <coughs> campaign in the Southern Department. I'd always been a staunch Federalist, and in 1812, when Mr. Madison's war broke out. I went to Baltimore to my friend, Charles Hanson, the publisher. His Federalist paper infuriated the Baltimore mob. They attacked his property, and we defended it. Some of the rioters were killed, in consequence of which we were arrested, put into Baltimore jail. The turnkeys then admitted the mob, and we were beaten up to cries of, let's tar and feather every damn British Tory. That's the way for American glory. Some of us were beaten to death, and I received injuries from which I think I will, will never recover. Let's not dwell on these unpleasantnesses. Rather, 
Let us turn our eyes to something far more pleasant. Siege and capture of Fort Mott. We just dined excellently here tonight. The very best meal I have tasted since. That meal Mrs. Mott served to us after the capture of Fort Mott. Now it is my great, great privilege to present to you that most gracious and distinguished of patriot ladies, Mrs. Rebecca Mott.
called it Buckhead at the time, we used to think Jefferson Brown. And, and settled in a beautiful home with my daughters. Now my oldest had married to Thomas Pinkney, and of course he was serving in the army. And she, of course, was worried. But with me, she felt secure. I should have known it was too good to be true. No sooner had we really gotten up there and settled in and started our life, but here comes the British again. Now this time, instead of just merely coming in and living in my house and expecting me to feed them and take care of all those little things that a hostess would do for her guests, they said to me, Madam, you can have one apartment for you and your daughters. We're taking over the rest of the house and the ground. And then proceeded, as kindly as they were, to dig a huge moat, trench, hole, whatever you would, around my house. My beautiful gardens are now nothing but mud. Then we go and cut my trees and build a palisade, a parapet. They make it a fort. How was I to know that this beautiful, beautiful spot overlooking the river between Charleston and Camden would be the most perfect place to have a depot? But that's what they used it for. That was a way to make sure that the goods from Charleston got to the British and Camden and then messages could get back from Captain to trust. Well, I understood that there was something going on up, up towards Captain, overheard snatches of conversation at tables and such. And one day I was told, you must remove yourself from the past. Well, where am I supposed to go? This is my home. Where are you sending me? There's another house over across the ravine. You can go over there. It was my overseer's son. He expected me to go live where my overseer lived. Well, I understood shortly why he wanted me out. And this was uh, Captain McPherson, I believe his name was. I can never get the rank straight. You'll have to forgive me. They have things on their shoulders and I can never get for them, which is what. Um, Anyway, turns out that American forces have surrounded my home, which is now being called Fort Mott. Well, I was very honored to have something named after the family. I just wish it hadn't been Fort. <laughs> so I removed myself to the overseer's house and watch as uh, the rest of my grounds are dug up for trenches by Francis Marion and his men. And uh, Colonel Lee is across the other way. And I hear a boom every so often. And uh, they have brought a piece of artillery and they are shooting at my house. Oh, joy. <laughs> well, I figured we couldn't get any worse. I mean, they dug up my yard, they cut down all my trees, they're shooting a cannon at my house. Nothing else can happen, right? Wrong. One more time, I received a visit by uh, Colonel Lee and the General Colonel, the wonderful man, Francis Marion. Not what you want to call a prepossessing figure, but I think he had a kind and Colonel Lee comes to me and says, Madam, we have something to say to you. And I said, Yes, I'm not sure what else I can give you. The British have my house in Charleston. They have my house here. I have no sons. I'm out of money. What more can I give you? And Colonel Lee says, Madam, we need to remove the British from your house. I said, there are 160 
about men and men and officers. How are you, do you propose to get the British out of my house if firing your cannon at it hasn't worked yet? Madam, Lord Broughton is right over there. Do you see the fires? <laughs> yes, yeah, all the last night. Madam, he's going to come and bring the horses. Our only choice is to uh, burn him. Excuse me? Madam, we need to burn your house. Oh, that Well, I'd be gratified if we need to do that. I mean, if we have to remove vermin, that's one of the best ways to do it, isn't it? Is to burn it. General, uh, Colonel Lee, I am more than happy to give this little bit more to the cause. If this will ensure our liberty further on down the road, you have my permission. Now, the funny thing is about my, my brother is that he had interests all over the world. And he had been given by someone in the East Indies a bow and arrow. And I wasn't sure how they planned to get fire to my roof. They're still about four to four hundred yards away. And I said, Well, sir, would it help? I've got these bows and arrows that belong to my brother and somehow got in the luggage here. Would would that help? And he said, No, no, no. Uh, Mrs. Mary's got someone who can do this. And I said, oh, really? And he said, well, yes, there's a, a young soldier. And it's funny, I cannot remember anything else except I remember that young soldier's name because he was very apologetic. He looked at me and he said, I, I, I beg your pardon. Nathan Savage, a very pleasant young man. I hope his parents were very proud of him. He had like a sling, something that would sling this thing. Well, he had all the pitch and whatever. When he lit it, it wouldn't go out, even if you blew on it. And he flung it onto my roof. And being that it had been hot and it hadn't been rain, the roof went up pretty quickly. And he threw a couple more on there just to be sure that it would catch. And then when the British came up trying to get the shingles off, they would fire the cannon at them. And of course, the muskets. I don't think the muskets were very effective, but the cannon certainly was. And I stood there, and I said, I wish I had a peek to us Well, it turned out that there was a great deal of gunpowder in the house. And uh, Captain McPherson decided that he really didn't want to be his maker at that moment. So he said, everybody else. And they ran into the arms of the leading Americans and surrendered. At that point, Francis Marion and Colonel Lee made sure that my house, the roof fire was put out. And I did not lose too much. And I was able to, to live in it. It needed some repair. And to show my gratitude that evening, I invited Gerald Marion, and I invited uh, Colonel Lee, and their all British officer prisoners to dine with me, albeit at the overseer's house. Now, we were having a wonderful dinner, and at least I was able to make some sallies, which the British officers had to sit and swallow. When somebody comes in with General Marion's ear, and he jumps up and he says, I will not have it, by God. I will have their bloody heads. Now, such language at a dinner table. I was appalled. I mean, really, I never he was a Malaysia officer, but no. And we all left up, raised down to see what he was talking about. Well, it appears. Colonel Lee's men had found some Tories that they were not very obliged to, and they decided to hang them. Well, two of the men had already expired, but the third one was cut down, and as he was still alive, he was preserved. And General Marion said, it is my order that no one 
is to handle hand any more of these men. I am in command here, and my order shall stand, because whatever you do to one of them, I will certainly do to you. Now, show the quality of the man, and how difficult it must have been for him to have to come and ask for a woman to give up her last vestige of, of well, And so that was the end of the story. Uh, it was quite exciting now that I look back on it. Unfortunately, uh, my son-in-law, Thomas Pinkney, was wounded in Camden. My poor daughter had to worry about him for quite a while. The other two married well. And now I look forward to time of free peace and plenty. I have a lot of work to do. All my fortune has been pretty much dispersed. My uh, husband, before his death and before the war, has pledged a lot of his uh, future income to cover debts. And he is a man of honor, and I will honor his memory. And I will see that those debts are covered. my mind. Thank you for your indulgence in allowing me to remain in song. Ladies and gentlemen, we're most happy to have you all here in the back country with us. And our guests, Mrs. Mott, General Merriam, Lieutenant Colonel Lee have agreed to come back up and answer any of your questions about the period. So without further ado, if the uh, folks would come back up.
realize that, as I said, the only way to get rid of burning sometimes is to burn it. And I said to him, sir, I would be gratified if you would do such a thing so that I could prove my loyalty to my new country. I cannot sufficiently express my relief, madam, when you agreed. <coughs> so embarrassed. General Marion had given me the dirty task of asking. <laughs> <laughs> the only occasion I've known General Marion to show the white feather. <laughs> well, sir, I, I'm not sure that I would say that about General Marion, however, perhaps considering the delicacy of it, he thought, being that um, you would be going back to Virginia, that <laughs> perhaps I would not hold the grudge quite so much. What's it, madam? <laughs> <laughs> so, we know that you're a lot of Virginia colony homes, but where else might you choose to live? <sighs> well, I would very much, I think, like to have a rice plantation in the Carolinas, <laughs> but uh, avoiding it during high summer. <laughs> Quite enough experience of high summer <laughs> in your Carolinas. <laughs> Uh, Colonel Lee, can you tell us about uh, any um, recollections after the war about the hanging of uh, Mr. Hayne? No. It was a most regrettable, unfortunate, and barbaric action on the part of the British. But I remember when I published the first edition of my account of the war in the Southern Department, I sent a copy to Lord Rawdon. Marquis of Hastings, as he had become by then, and I received a six-page letter of explanation and whitewash, which did not carry total conviction. Nevertheless, I was impressed that he wrote. In fact, uh, he was quite a gracious uh, gentleman. Uh, I'd just like to share this with you, if I may, uh, General and Mrs. Mark. This is the uh, letter that uh, I received from him immediately after our capture of uh, Fort Mott. And I'll try to do it in my Lord Broad voice. <laughs> Sir, I beg leave to return you many thanks for your great politeness in transmitting to me the letters that fell into your possession at the Mott House that was supposed to be for me. Lieutenant McPherson, having mentioned to me that you propose an exchange of the garrison taken at that post, I have only to promise that an equal number of continental officers and soldiers shall be immediately set free at liberty for all such as General Green shall think fit to send to Charlestown. I have the honor to be, sir, your obedient servant, Rawdon. He did write a very polite letter. <laughs> But I would say that politeness does not cover the crime, sir. Uh, I, I, as I was trying to recruit people uh, to join my regiment and to fight with me, I would never have been able to find enough willing to fight had it not been for the cruelties of the British. Uh, they, they ruined our houses, they ruined our farms, they burned down our places, they ran off our cattle, and they stole things from our homes, and they murdered in cold blood, a good many of our people. And this ma enabled me to be able to fill my ranks and to do the part that South Carolinians needed to do to redeem their own country. Very true, sir. That was what added relish to Pyle's hacking match. <laughs> General Mayor, please give us insight into when you tease Carl from Chase from Jack Street to Ox Swan. How might the war have been different if Thompson had followed up to your traffic and both Perry? Vanessa Tarleton was a particular man, and he's the sort of man that the rest of mankind is ashamed of. He was a murderer in a, in a green outfit. Uh, he, he pursued Americans simply because they were Americans, and he fought for the love of fighting. It was a great pleasure to deal in combat with him because it was on my territory. It was in my areas. 
I knew the grounds, and he didn't. And I faded it over and over again, because his, his soldiers were better equipped than mine. His soldiers were better trained than mine. His soldiers generally were better fed than mine. And so the only way that I could handle the, the, the dispute with Tarleton and his crowd was to outwit them all and to wear them out. And so, after crossing Jack's Creek, I intentionally went into the, into the forests, my territory, into the swamps, my territory, into the glades, my territory. And he tried to follow, and he tried to follow on horseback where my horses could get through because we knew the way. We knew where the trees were the thickest. We knew where the roads were. We were able to lead him astray and, and, and to get him completely confused and tangled within the swamp. I was very pleased to hear that he had said that I was a fox. It was a sobriquet that I carried with some pleasure in my own heart. And now since the war is over, I hear more and more people referring to me as a, not only a fox, but as a swamp fox. It was a good lesson me to teach the British. The British Army was the best army in the world, we were told. And yet, fighting our way, in our land, and, and, and with our support, they lost. And they lost. And they lost. And it was a great joy to me. <laughs> Well, for the most part, the officers were gentlemen, although they would taunt me from time to time at table about my uh, allegiance. Um, I tried to keep my children, my daughters, away from the British officers' eyes as much as possible. Uh, there was no sense in putting temptation in their way. My daughters are young women and, and of marriageable age, and therefore possibly temptation to officers who are far from I uh, first like to express General Lincoln's warmest regards from Massachusetts and uh, warm memories of service with you. Uh, but we have some some question about there appears to be some degree of of uh, lack of cooperation between you and General Sumter. We're kind of confused at what the origin of that was. I was wondering if you could comment on your feelings about General Sumter. <laughs> I would say that uh, uh, General Sumter was a very successful general. General Sumter contributed greatly to our ultimate victory. I think that the difference between uh, Tarleton and Sumter uh, was great, but not that great. <laughs> uh, uh, general Sumter was very proud, a proud man. In some instances, he seemed to me to be more proud of himself and his reputation than he was of winning the war. Uh, uh, General Sumter, in his way, uh, persecuted the American people. Uh, he took from people who were notorious Tories, but he also took from people who were not so notorious and maybe were not really Tories people whom we might have been able to swing back to our side. But he alienated them. He took over their properties. He took over their animals, particularly horses. We always needed horses, always needed horses. And I could not do without horses. And when he dared to suggest to General Green that I had a surplus of horses and could give some to General Green, I thought at first, he didn't know what he was talking about. But then I realized he did know what he was talking about. And I thought that he was trying to pauperize my forces so that his forces would be the ones left in the field. It's the reason I did not like Mr. Sumter. But I do say that he won key battles and he contributed to our victory in the war. Perhaps we would have won quicker, better, and certainly more honorably without him. <laughs> uh, 
General Marion, I, I hope you had a pleasant visit with your friend Peter Ory. But what do you think of him as the biographer? <laughs> uh, Peter has uh, told me that he's beginning to write some of the memoirs. And I'm a little nervous about what the memoirs will say. <laughs> but deep in my own heart, I am persuaded that my course during the war was an honorable course. I instructed my men that they were not to loot the neighborhoods. They were not to take uh, goods without leaving some sort of message behind or giving a receipt for those goods. Uh, regardless of what people will say in the future, uh, my heart is clear and I stand ready to, to stand responsible for anything that I did during the war that was not within the accepted rules of, of war. Now, Peter, Peter and I were very good friends. And we would have remained friends except for the fact that he grew ill during the war and was not able to carry on his duties. And so I assigned sometimes those duties to someone else. And he took offense at that. Particularly did he take offense at Hezekiah Mayhem which a man, by the way, a good many people took offense at. <laughs> uh, and, and, and when I noted that Peter did actually outrank Mayhem by a few days, but only a few days, then Mayhem got upset about it and even withdrew from the service for a while. And, I, and I'm afraid that maybe Peter will have his views tainted by the fact that I did have to mediate between him and Mayhem and did not always come down entirely on the same side that Peter wanted me to come back on. On the other hand, since, if, since the hostilities have ceased, our friendship has come back. We are, we are almost as good friends as we ever were, and we love to sit around and talk about the old days, and we visit some of the battlefields. We see some of the men that fought with us. It, it's, a, it's a cordial relationship, and one for which I'm grateful. If Peter O'Ree says I did it, I probably did it. <laughs> probably. <laughs> oh, Mary, is it true that after the war, the government uh, didn't get the pension that I thought it would uh, be the protest? Uh, after the war was over, the, the state of South Carolina, I, I was a senator, the state of South Carolina gave me a medal. Uh, incidentally, I was promoted in the Continental Line to be a full colonel. The same day I was promoted to be a full colonel, there were 29 others that were promoted to be brigadier generals. Nevertheless, I was pleased to be uh, promoted. The state offered me a pension. Uh, at first, it was to be a, a, a payment of 500 pounds. 500 English pounds. But then, uh, in subsequent legislation, they reduced it to $500. And the $500 was never paid. To compensate for that, they made me the commandant at Fort Johnson, which is there in Charleston Harbor. And I was to be paid as the commandant. The pay did not come regularly, but sometimes it came. But I was able to, to sort of uh, uh, redeem that situation I appointed several of my cousins and nephews to be also there at Fort Johnson and to be paid. I also arranged for some of my slaves and some of my wife Esther's slaves to be hired out to work there at Fort Johnson. So our family did benefit, but it was uh, as much from my own wiles as it was from the generosity of the state. <laughs> I was disappointed that the state was not able to carry through its promises, but then the state was in considerable trouble from other directions as well. The state had financial problems. I assume the state will never have financial problems again. General <laughs> 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 Mary, would you tell us about Oscar? Uh, Oscar was, was, was one of the strong supports throughout the war. <laughs> Oscar, Oscar was probably twice, maybe three times as big as I. He's a big black man, a faithful servant, who was a faithful servant during the war, who knew the trails that I didn't know, who knew how to cook, who knew how to keep P 
people comfortable when there was no comfort to be had otherwise. Oscar was a wonderful man. He's been a wonderful man since the war. He's still with me. And occasionally he and I, when I feel up to it in these days when, when uh, the arthritis is so bad and the rheumatism is so bad, uh, he occasionally puts me in the carriage and we ride around to some of the battlefields and we meet with people that we had before. Oscar is a great man, a great man, and I'm grateful for him. Thank you for asking about Oscar. Important. General, we've heard that you required your men to drink vinegar and water. Can you explain that to us? You know, I have forgotten who told me about that, <laughs> but I, was un I understood that the Roman soldiers in ancient days, in order to sustain themselves and to, and to quell their appetites, but also to give them extra energy, that they drank vinegar. And so I said to my troops, when we were on the march and we were on the, on the rides and when we were not getting much sleep and we were constantly uh, alert and, and the nerves were wearing thin, that part of the food that we ate, in addition to the sweet potatoes and the occasional time when we were able to eat some pork or some beef uh, and, and, and other meats, that we would also take as part of our daily ration a mixture of vinegar and water. Sometimes it made the camp smell less than delicious, but it kept the men's energy up. I think we have to uh, say goodnight to General Marion. His age uh, means that it's well past his uh, normal bedtime. <laughs> Thank them for their wonderful